In 1930, when the struggle for independence in India from the British was beginning to heat up and was beginning to get some traction, the leaders of the, the Indian National Congress, the, the, one of the leading groups, the one that Gandhi was in charge of, uh, met to discuss what their strategy was going to be, what they would do next as a way of drawing attention to their, their cause and hopefully bringing the, the government more uh, actively to the table to begin to negotiate. They had already committed to be nonviolent. You may know that Gandhi's philosophy was called Satyagraha, which means nonviolent resistance. He had convinced everybody that this was important. And so they, they were convinced they were going to do that rather than take up arms, which is a matter of what, what they were going to choose to do. There were apparently quite a few attorneys in their leadership who said, well, what we should do is violate a law somewhere, civil disobedience. And they suggested, well, maybe we shouldn't pay any land taxes. But Gandhi had a better idea. He gathered a group of his followers, people who had been carefully trained, you wouldn't think it would be necessary, but who were trained how to be nonviolent, and they walked across India for a month and a half until they came to the ocean. When they got there, Gandhi broke the law. As one writer describes it, he took a handful of salty mud, and he took a cup of salty water, he mixed them together, and violated the law because the making and selling of salt was a government monopoly. This ought to make sense to you if you think of where salt comes from. We typically mine it under the ground or we have to make it by evaporating seawater in enormous ponds. And so it's, it's a big undertaking. It's a, an industrial sort of process and has been for most of human history if you didn't live right at the ocean. So governments took that on as one of their jobs and they made money from it by taxing it. So by making your own salt and not paying the government's tax, you broke the law. Gandhi had a particular reason why he chose this way of breaking the law, of drawing attention to his cause. He said it was because it was something that everyone needs and that everyone can understand. Certainly, I have read a lot about salt this week. Normally, when I get up and do one of these sermons, what I'm afraid of is I'm going to say something about gardening that will turn out to be untrue. Today, I have to worry I'm going to say something about chemistry that will turn out to be untrue. There are chemists among us, dear friends. You may not recognize them, but they're there. Salt is one of those really basic things that we must have. We die without it. A little bit of it seasons food. A lot of it preserves food. It is all around us in, in all sorts of things where we don't even think we're going to find it. It is in our sight ourselves in ways that we don't necessarily recognize. And yet, if you think about where salt comes from, the pieces of creation that go into it are, are dangerous. Sodium and chlorine, they're both poisonous. One explodes if it comes into contact with water. The other kills you if you breathe it. And yet when they come together, they make something that is much more stable and much more important to us. I think Jesus probably had all of that in mind, perhaps not in those specific chemistry lesson terms, when he was talking to his followers. Salt is mentioned in three out of the four Gospels, always in the context of telling people about how important it is, and yet how important it is that it does its job. In all three of those cases, Jesus talks about what happens when salt no longer is salty, when it's no longer doing what it was meant to do. That ought to make us stop and wonder, since Jesus has referred to his followers as the salt of the earth, what it means to stop being salty, especially when we hear these somewhat worrying lessons that we hear this morning. Twice in the lessons this morning, we hear about somebody doing the work who wasn't necessarily seen as a member of the club. And if that weren't bad enough, there's also all this talk about cutting things off, which really ought to sound to us like worrying about what pieces of the body of Christ are no longer doing what it is they were intended to do. So thinking about what it means to be salty is important, and it's worth unpacking for a few minutes, I think, what it is that we might take away from this, what we should be meditating on in our own lives. And I have a few of those things to suggest to you. The first is the clear distinction between enough and too much. 
those who are the nerdy in the congregation may know the show Futurama. I turn around and look at the people who probably will know, yeah. From the 1990s and the 2000s, there was one episode of it where there's a character who's a robot who doesn't really understand human life particularly well, who hangs out with all these humans, and for some reason he becomes the cook for everybody else. And he makes them dinner, and they're seen eating it, and being in great distress as soon as they begin eating it. And he's hurt and offended, and his comment is, well, it only had 98% of the lethal dose of salt in it. That which is enough and that which is too much have to be very carefully understood and kept very carefully separate. We see this in all aspects of our lives. Anything that is good can easily be present in too small an amount and have no effect at all, or be present in too large an amount and end up being a major problem. This month, as we are, that we are now ending, we've been talking about God's economy and the way that we organize the household of God here among us, particularly as it involves money. And clearly, I think you would agree that whenever there is too much money, we tend to become focused on money. And whenever there is too little, we tend to become focused on money. But the same is true about virtually everything else in our life together. The key is that we need to have just enough, but not too much. If the salt is too little, what will we accomplish? We won't taste it. If the salt in our life together in God's household is not enough, we will not be salty enough to accomplish what it is that God desires us to do. So, a key thing to take away and to meditate on in our own lives and in every possible dimension is when not enough and too much are turning out to be the normal way that we manage rather than letting enough be what we're aiming for. The second important piece of all this is, second, I rarely have to do this. For some reason, I'm a little off this morning. The idea, this, this cutting off thing, I think there is something in it about that which is needing to change. You would, may know that when Jesus talks to his followers about cutting something off, that would have been extremely offensive to them. They understood that if they were to be resurrected at the end of time, they had to have their whole body with them. So you had to have all the pieces all the way to the end in order to get where you needed to go. When he talks about cutting things off because they're no longer useful, that, that is, is a new and different idea. We might smile and nod and say, well, yeah, those people didn't really understand, but how much of that is also present in our own common life? How often do we hold on to things that we no longer really use? How long, often do we hold on to things that are no, no longer really useful to us in building God's household here? There is a process of being created and recreated. I talked about this yesterday in another service that we had here. It is really, really important for us to see. There will always be a necessary process of looking at what we have, what we use it for, being willing to set down those things that are no longer as useful to us as they once were. Earlier in the month, we heard the writer of James talking about that community which appears to be alive on the outside but is dead on the inside. There is that risk that the church will become a shell, alive on the outside seemingly, but dead on the inside. There must be mission for all that we have talked about what it costs to run a church this month, we must never forget that the costs must always be in service to the mission of the church. The life inside is what we are supporting. So looking at that life and looking at what it means to have it, what it means to maintain it, what it means to keep it and allow it to expand and to grow into what God intends it to be is important as a part of maintaining and building the household of God here. A third 
piece, and here I get even more dangerously into chemistry territory, is bringing together volatile elements. Salt is a combination of things that are dangerous, that have a lot of energy in them, contained in them, that, that, that needs to expand and go someplace. Does that sound at all like what a typical church family is like? There's an awful lot of energy. One of the things that comes out of organizational development is the idea of putting heat into the container. This also comes from chemistry, but I won't get into that piece because I will get it wrong. Whenever passionate people come together, whenever they bring all of the, the, the faithful intentions, all of the concerns for the world, everything that God has poured into their hearts together, whenever they're in the same place, why would there not be friction? Why would there not be energy that needs to go somewhere? So if we are truly salty, dear friends, we should never expect to have complete peace. We should never expect to have perfect harmony. We should always expect to be wrestling with one another in a godly way, not for our own advancement, but for the good of the kingdom of God. We must remember that if there is something mysterious in the world of chemistry and physics that holds the sodium and the chloride together to make salt, there is something mysterious and holy that holds us together as well. And it is the presence of Christ. The grace of God is what keeps us from spinning off into every possible direction. We who are passionate, we who love God, we who desire deeply to serve God, are held together as a community because Jesus is at the center and we are drawn toward Jesus. So don't fear if it seems that we can't quite make up our mind. Don't fear if it seems that we're struggling to decide what we should do. As long as Jesus is at the center, as long as the grace of God is flowing among us, we will hang together. And then the fourth important point is the idea that somehow there are others who are also doing the work. As our church movement, as Christianity in the world changes, as it becomes something other than perhaps what it has been in the memory of most of us, we are nonetheless still called to do the same things. We still desire to heal, clothe, feed, educate, reconcile, bring justice, do all of those things that the world needs so much. We'll just have to figure out different ways to do it. If we look just outside these windows, just outside that wall, there are other people who care about those things too. They may not look like us, they may not speak like us, we may never see them in this room. But if we will notice that they are in some way building the kingdom of God, as we understand it, even if they don't necessarily even call it that, we will find ways that we can work together. We will find ways that we can see in them the image of Christ. And together, we can build something bigger than we would have been able to do on our own. There will be creativity required to build the household of God, to maintain the household of God. We focus, and we have focused this month largely on what it means in a practical way to manage all that. We should never forget that is spiritual work. You and I are called to see God working in everything that we do. And so, as we end this month of talking about God's economy, I exhort you, dear friends, to be salty, to look for that salt within you, that seasoning that needs to come out somehow into the community, recognizing that somehow we have been given everything that we need. We have more than enough. We have only to recognize where it is and put it to good use. Be salty. Amen.